so this is where we get to this sort of big burning question. Sounds great. I'm going to take factors and I want to predict items of them. It sounds awesome. Well, but wait a second. Where, how do I get factors? Where do factors come from? So how do we predict items with factors we can't measure directly? These, we're still in the same place where we, we have a, there's a thing missing here, right? Uh, this is where the mathematics comes in. So we're going to, we're going to, there's a process sort of behind the scenes that we're not going to go in and sort of avoid the mathematics, but it's, it's, we're going to use a, a geometric process to try to um, project linear um, vectors, lines in the space to try to capture as much of the, the patterns and the correlations as possible. And each one of those is going to explain um, some portion of the variability. And if I have something like 20 items, well, I can actually do 20 projections in the space. I can actually do it 20 times. It's just if I do it 20 times with 20 items, well, that's pretty boring. Right? It's not very interesting. If I try to explain 20 things with 20 things, well, I've missed out on one of the main goals of factor analysis, which is data reduction. I haven't reduced anything. I'm just replicating it with a different set of things. So the very long story short here is we use a mathematical procedure to piece together what call them super variables, these sort of projections, these vectors in the space that we use as a proxy or fill-in or a stand-in for the factor themselves. <clears throat> so we don't have factors, but let's actually use some mathematics and be smart about it, actually project things in space, see what we can, see what we can do mathematically to, to create stand-ins for, think about stand-ins like, you know, when, when actors have stand-ins and they're doing lighting, you know, people just stand there and they do lighting. Same kind of thing. These aren't really the factors, but we're going to use them in place of the factors so that, so that we can see, well, how much variability really is explained by this thing. If it's explaining quite a bit of variability, well, it probably corresponds to the factor. And because we have established this thing as a projection in space, we can also then correlate each item with that projection and get the loadings. We can actually compute loadings and things by, by looking at how much each item relates to this, this linear projection in space and, and be able to piece together lots of, lots of components that we need to try to build this up. So we're going to use these, these uh, projections in the space to stand in in place of the factors we're looking for and see if they work and see how well they work or how many of these things do I need to really explain this and then if we actually can find uh, these stand-ins that work pretty well we can get them pretty close to the factors we then can understand how well each items actually go uh, uh, relate to those things and how items go together and which items load on which of these and we can start to sort of make decisions about how items work together in these types of um, more complex scales you can think about uh, taking you know, a correlation matrix or something, a bunch of correlations, and think about applying them out in, into space and sort of where you know, they would all sort of create different uh, lines out in, different, in space, being all over the place, right? It's hard to picture because anything more than like three of them it goes beyond our sort of ability to picture them. What this process does is it, it does sort of, it thinks about the, the correlation in this sort of geometric space and it starts to project um, linear projections out through that space to try to capture as much variance of the items in space as possible. So we're basically using something like a, a very complicated form of regression to project these sort of lines in the space. So if you had, um, you know, if you think about three-dimensionally, if you had something like a football or something, this is a paper towel roll, okay? So imagine, again, this is, to think about this in sort of three dimensions, um, you know, if you have points that are sort of lining up in three dimensions, right? So there, you know, there's, there's, you know, you have three, let's say you have three items, three correlations, right? You're trying to, to um, sort of sitting out in space and I'm trying to, f to project, uh, a, a find some linear combination that goes through this space that's going to explain the most variance. I'm likely going to, 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 to sort of put it right down the center, right? So if I put it right down the middle, imagine... I don't have anything long enough, but imagine, you know, you have a progression that's going right, right through the middle of this, this space. That's going to be sort of the best 
linear combination is going to go through the space to try to try to explain most of the variance that's around uh, these points out in space. The problem is once you get beyond just two dimensions or three dimensions, we can't even picture it. But mathematically, it's still possible to do 15 dimensions or whatever. It, it, it's going to do it. The problem is the more dimensions you have, the more you can actually project out into space. So if you have you know a whole bunch of you know points out in space like this, sure I can actually take and it looks like okay if I if I want to try to explain my best linear projection I can do this, and where it differs from regular regression is, okay we know that this doesn't explain so it goes the best line goes through there, and because I have two variables say like this. Um, this is going to go through there, but there's going to be a bunch of residual. Right? I'm going to have residuals left over. It's going to be variance that isn't explained. So I can easily bring in a another projection that is orthogonal, perpendicular, uncorrelated to the first to try to then explain the rest of the variance that the first one couldn't explain. So if you have 20 items with a, just a ton of correlations, I could have up to 20 different combinations where I can project the first one would explain the most variance possible going through this crazy 20 dimensional space. But then, I, then once that's out there, I'm going to have another one that's going to come in and is orthogonal to the first one. And there's still going to be variance left over and have another one that's orthogonal to the first two. And I'm going to keep doing that and cycling down, putting uh, these projections into space until all the variance is explained, or at least I've explained enough that I, that I don't feel like I need any more. And we'll talk about that in a second. Because if I have 20 items, I can always explain 20 items with 20 dimensions, but that's not very interesting. Remember, the goal of this is I want to reduce. I want to take this large correlation matrix and I want to reduce it down, explain it with less than uh, 20 dimensions, right? So, I, but I can continue doing this. And this process, this thing that I'm talking about, and I'm talking about in very generic terms, is um, this, it's called, it's, it's either, you either can see it called singular value decomposition, singular Value decomposition, value, not, not veil, value decomposition. It's literally um, taking and, and breaking down these large things into single values, right? into single sort of projections. So uh, it's more commonly referred to, though, as... Um, the sort of eigenvalue, eigenvalue, eigenvector. Okay, so what's a vector? A vector is a projection into space. So these vectors are being projected out into space. So what's the eigenvalue? Well, the as this this thing gets projected into space. It can tell me then how much sort of variance was actually explained by the vector. And that amount of variance that's explained is the eigenvalue. It's also the singular value sort of written about here, these sort of variance components that we get from this thing. So what this does is it breaks every matrix down into two parts, vectors and values. The vector is the sort of projection in the space. The value is then how much that project, how good a job that projection did at trying to capture the variance. All right, this is all we're going to talk about this. I just want to put it out there. It's there. You can do with it what you like, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about this. This is sort of the mathematics behind it. We're going to treat this from this point forward, okay? This is our, you know, this is sort of magic. <laughs> we're just going to assume that this happens. <laughs> That's it. Okay, so the, in the background, the mathematics of this is sort of occurring, and then we're going to look at sort of the aftermath. Once we with this, once this happens, what do we then do with it to sort of decide how this all works? The main thing is, though, each of these projections, this projection into space, this eigenvector. So this thing, this is going to be a proxy. It's going to be a stand-in. I wrote that in the wrong bed, please do. <clears throat> this is going to be a stand-in for us. So it's going to stand in for the factor. That sounds strange, but we're going to create this sort of mathematical projection into space 
and we're going to allow this thing to sort of proxy for um, for each of the factors that we want. All right, so we're basically creating these mathematical factors, and we're going to use those to then decide how each item that relates to it. And we're going to you're going to use this as a stand-in for um, the thing we're trying to measure. So instead of using some like total score composite like we do with, with classical test theory, we're actually going to use these mathematical vectors to stand in for each of the factors we're trying to measure. And if it, if it comes back and tells us, well, we, we only really need one vector to explain all the variance, well, then we probably have a unidimensional model, and we, we can just base everything off that. If it comes back and tells us we have three, well, it looks like we probably have three different factors that we have to sort of look at how each of those factors relate to the items. So it's a way for us to try to figure out how many things, vectors, factors, we need to try to, to explain all the variance we have, all the different um, correlations we have, in our data. But again, this is going to happen and it's going to be like magic. It's, going to, it's in the background. Um, it isn't, but um, let's just, this is like our, our like black box. We're going to put stuff into it, it's going to give it back to us, and then we're going to interpret what that is. All right, so you're going to put a correlation matrix into this process, and out of that is going to come um, information we use for doing the factor analysis. Okay, so factors come from this geometric decomposition, this eigenvalue, eigenvector, eigenvector decomposition. A coalition matrix is then broken down into smaller chunks, where each chunk is a projection into a cluster of data points. These are the eigenvectors. And then each vector is created to explain the maximum amount of correlation matrix and the amount of variability explained then is the eigenvalue. The eigenvector is the actual projection, this mathematical linear projection into space. The eigenvalue then is the amount of variance that that uh, eigenvector explains. And we can actually then look at that eigenvalue to, to, to judge the quality of each vector. Is it actually explaining enough variance to be worth keeping as a factor, to be worth using as a factor in our theory about these sort of items. Okay. Factors come, oh yeah, I mentioned mean, it's, it's from this geometric decomposition. Each eigenvector is created to maximize the relationship among the variables. It's trying to figure out a way to get the, get the most commonality for each item. And what we're going to do is we're going to let each vector sort of stand in for the factor we're trying to identify and then see how much each item then relates to it, and we can judge whether or not it's actually a good factor or a bad factor, and whether the items actually relate to each other or not. We can actually use that then to, um, to retool the, the scale, to make decisions about stuff based on how it actually all sort of holds together. Right. Great. So, again, we're not gonna talk a whole lot about that. So there's this, there's this magic that occurs. <laughs> The mathematical magic, things get projected in space. We look at how well they, they actually explain the relationships among items, and we let those those mathematical projections sort of stand in for the factors we're trying to identify. And then we start looking at how the items relate to the factors and all this stuff based on these sort of eigenvectors. And that's it. Now let's talk about the other stuff. So what you're gonna get when you do a factor analysis, you're gonna start off with something called an observed correlation matrix, which is not very fancy. It just means it's a correlation matrix that you start off with. You have a bunch of items, you correlate them, uh, and that's your observed correlation matrix, right? This is just the correlation matrix between them. Then you're going to get a re reproduced correlation matrix. So when you actually do the factor model, you actually run the factor analysis, you, it does the eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition, and all this other stuff, mathematics behind it, it's going to spit back to you a reproduced factor, I'm oh, sorry, reproduced correlation matrix that are based on the factor model, based on some of the, the decisions you made, like how many factors are there and other stuff we'll talk about in a second. So it's gonna reproduce it. You're gonna put a correlation matrix in, you're gonna get a correlation matrix out. They're likely to be a little bit different. You can subtract them and get what's called a residual correlation matrix. This is the difference between the observed and reproduced matrices. If you have 20 items and you extract 20 factors, your observed and reproduced will be exactly the same because you've explained 20 things with 20 things. However, if you decide to only extract or only keep 
three factors, 20 items, you keep three factors, your reproduced matrix is likely not to uh, recover all of the original because you didn't, you, you're trying to explain 20 things with three things, three factors, right? So you can actually see then the residual correlation matrix will likely have some values in it. The, the residual is actually going to have um, some non-zero numbers. You can start to see where your decision to keep the factors that you did, the, where they don't work and where they do work. Because any place where this is zero, it means you completely reproduced the original matrix. Any place where it's not zero means that there's some, there's some difference between your observed and reproduced. All right. So I've already I've used the term extraction before, but it really is just the term extraction really refers to let's use this eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition, and then decide whether we're going to do principal components analysis, which is one method, or factor analysis. So there's these two different approaches, two different extraction methods, along with the number of factors you're going to extract. So when people talk about extraction, it talks about how you are extracting, whether it's principal components or some form of factor analysis. And um, there are a bunch. So you're going to decide on the method of extraction. There are like dozens of them. Most of them are factor analytic. There's like maximum likelihood factor analysis. There's what's called principal axis factoring. There's alpha factory factoring, image factoring. Uh, there's a bunch of them. Principal components is just one choice amongst many, and it comes down again to this is more atheoretical and more descriptive, and that's likely because this one, I think it trying not to go in too technical. This is like a, this is sort of like a one-off. Right? It does, it does what it does sort of one time and gives you an answer. All right, so it looks at the correlation matrix, looks at the factors, it figures out what it is, you decide some things, spits back to you uh, loadings and things, and that's it. This one is iterative. So you get a correlation matrix, you do the extraction, you, you decide on, say, factor analysis, uh, one of the factor analysis methods. It does its thing, and it gives you back a reproduce matrix. And then it starts over again, does it again, and keeps doing it until the matrix that goes in and the matrix that comes out uh, is has very little difference. It's, it's what they call converges. It converges. It starts, the matrix that goes into the, to the, the process is the same as the one that comes out. And then it stops. The iteration stops. Usually you'll get somewhere between like five and 30 sort of iterations as it's trying to figure things out. It's trying to, to hone in on the right um, vectors to sort of, uh, you know, align everything together and all that stuff. It's trying to figure all that stuff out. So this is why this is, this one tends to be a little bit more um, theoretically driven, or people like the answers to this a little bit more. This one tends to overestimate everything because it is just a one-off, where this one tends to get a little bit closer to the real values and things like simulations. Um, this one's just easier often to do, which is why you see people do it when they probably should be doing this instead. Anyway, so along with how to extract the method, you also are going to extract, decide on the number of factors to extract, and there's a number of reasons why you would do that. You either have some theoretical reason, like, oh, I think, there, you know, I designed the scale to be, have three subscales, so you might want to then extract three. Um, but there are other, other methods, um, other choices. The default in a lot of programs is, if you're, is to extract any factor that has an eigenvalue over one. For instance, so if if a if you extract a factor in a model, its eigenvalue corresponding eigenvalue is over one unit. It's over one. Um, then you would keep that factor. That's the sort of the default in a lot of programs. So then we have things like loadings. Well, loading is a measure of the relationship between, um, it's basically analogous to a correlation between each item and the factor. It's the those size in the common factor model, again, usually they're denoted by A's. It's usually um, often that's called the A matrix, the loading matrix. If you're looking at um, the matrices in a program like SPSS or something. 
or SAS or R. Um, they're oftentimes denoted as uh, the A matrix. So here's here's what I'm sort of talking about this stuff. This is sort of the process of how this all goes down. So when you're doing a factor analysis, like we try to think, well, what's the point? How is this really back to measurement? How is this a um, you know sort of related to everything that we're talking about here? So you're going to start off. You're going to have a data matrix. Okay, so you're going to you're going to you're going to collect data on some scale. The scale is going to be this sort of one to k variables. These are the responses to the items on the scale. So like the CESD, you know, this is each. You're going to have one column for each item on the CESD, and then you're going to have a bunch of subjects, one to n. Right? You're going to have n subjects, so you're going to have the subjects responses here. So subject number one is going to have their responses for all the items across there, and subject two, three, four, all the way down. That's your data matrix. You're going to take the data matrix and you're going to correlate the items. So I'm going to correlate item one through k and create a correlation matrix. So this is my correlation matrix. So it's now one to k here, and it's also one to k there. So it's a k by k square matrix of uh, all the correlations between all of our items. This is then, um, this is basically the, the, the real data. The, 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 when you actually do a factor analysis, we're not actually analyzing the individual responses. We're analyzing the correlation matrix to try to find patterns. So we're going to submit this to an eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition. And then we're going to correlate all the items to those eigenvectors. And what's going to come out of that in is, is going to be this factor loading matrix. So here are my factors, however many factors I decided to extract. And the variables down to size is going to be 1 to k variables. And then 1 to j factors. So if I only extract 3 factors, this would be 1, 2, 3 factors. But if I had 10 items, it would still be 10 items all the way down. It tells me how each item relates to each factor. So these, these are all the loadings. These are all those size in the pictures from before. And then if I take my loading matrix, these are all my, my size, the, the loadings, the correlations between the factors and the items. I'm going to multiply that by its transpose. What the hell does that mean? You can tell me what does it mean to multiply by its transpose. Yeah, so like let's say yeah, I was trying to find something that had like some writing on it so you can see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so, like this, it's like some hand wipes I have. Okay, so here's some handy wipes, right? So this is like this, right? right? So it's like, it's in this direction. So in order, so notice this side here is the variables. And this side up here is the factors, okay? So in order to transpose this, I'm literally taking this whole thing I flip them. So again, this side is the is the variables. This side is the factors, right? So I'm flipping it like this, so that the variables are now here, and the factors are now there. Make sense? It says variables, but that's a lie. This is not variables. <laughs> These are the factors. These are the variables up here. Okay. So I forget this says variables. I don't know why it says variables. These are not the variables. These are the factors. Okay, so all I'm doing is taking each um, each column now becomes each row, and each row now becomes each column. Right? So it's being transposed. So if I take the factor loading matrix and I multiply it by its transpose, I'm now going to get a the reproduced correlation matrix. Okay, so think about that for a second. So if I have one to k variables. So my correlation matrix is 1 to k by 1 to k. So if I have a if I have variables that go 1 to k and multiply it by um, the you know these on this side where the the columns go 1 to k, if I multiply that by that, because the variables are the same number, 1 to k, I'm going to end up getting a k by k matrix on the end. If you don't really know matrix algebra, that's fine. Don't even worry about it. Just take my word for it. That if I multiply this k by j matrix by a j by k matrix, I'm going to get a k by k matrix. I'm able to reproduce the correlation matrix. Now, if my factors, 
number of factors equals my number of variables, or meaning that I, I've extracted the same number of factors as I have variables, which is, which is very uninteresting, by the way. So we're trying to reduce data. And I've just explained 10 things with 10 things. It doesn't, it's not really reducing anything. But if I do that, and I multiply this by this, this reproduced matrix will be exactly the same as the original matrix. It's going to be identical because I didn't lose anything. There's no information lost because I've contained every you know, conceivable factor I could have. What happens is as the number of factors J becomes less than the number of variables K, that this will not be fully reproduced. And, maybe, and it'll get close because sometimes if there's a lot of patterns, a lot of strong relationships among variables, you may only need a few factors to explain a lot of those variables. So you may, this could be close to the original correlation matrix, um, but it won't be exact. So we can actually take our original observed matrix, subtract out the reproduced matrix, and then we look at the residual matrix to see, okay, we're any place where this is sort of non-zero tells me there's a correlation or a relationship or something that, that my factor model didn't really account for very well. Um, and we can look a little more carefully at the, the factor. Um, this is just blowing up the, the, the factor loading matrix. If I, if I take and you know, square these values in here and square and, and add across, that will equal to my commonality. Remember, so it's the sum of the squared loadings you know, across, the, across the factors for each item equals my commonality. Right. So, that's, so it's like really talking about squaring each one of these going across and summing them, I'll get the commonalities there. So that's one that's how we sort of can com compute commonalities. Figure out the loadings that each, I each item has on all the factors, square item up, and that's your commonality. Um, if I instead square and add this way, this way, that should actually reproduce the sort of eigenvalues. So this is now the sum of the loadings for each um, Cross the items for each um, for each factor will then give me a. Uh, this is really my. I'll just say this. This isn't going to give you the sort of eigenvalue, the percentage of variance in uh, that each factor explains across all the items. All right. So if I'm summing squaring and summing this way, it tells me how good a job my factor is doing in explaining the items. If I square and sum this way, it tells me how good, um, how much variance my item is sharing with all the factors. What you start to do is you start to then look for patterns in these things, right? So if, so let's say, let's say in here I have, uh, I have, I end up with three factors. One, two, three factors that I ended up extracting. And I find out that, you know, there are substantial loadings for items. Uh, let's say there are, there are 10 items, right? So instead of K, it's, it's 10, okay? And I look at the, you know, the first three of them seem to have, you know, they seem to be, have decent loadings here, here, and here. And then you start to see that these have decent loadings there, 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 there. And then on three, you start getting the rest of them are all down here, right? So you start to see patterns that it looks like these items, whatever these items are, they seem to be related to each other because they're all related to this first factor. These items tend to go with whatever factor two is, and these ones go with factor three. And it starts to, to help you identify which items seem to go together and separate out that, all right, these items go together and they don't go with these items. Right? It starts to separate them out and tell you where items are sort of um, forming these sort of subscales, sub um, components, or these different factors. Okay, so 
this is how it, 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 by doing this, by extracting different factors, it's actually allowing us to identify the patterns of items that seem to go together. And then I can actually look at, you know, I can look at the actual, uh, the actual question, the content of these things, and see, all right, well, the reason why these items seem to go together is because they're targeting a similar content, and that's what that factor is really all about. So these, these three items seem to be talking about, um, you know, sadness. Right, so this is now my sort of sad subfactor of depression. These three items are talking about um, changes in the, in uh, the amount that you know the things that you used to enjoy you don't enjoy anymore. So these are all sort of questions around. Oftentimes it's called uh, it's a cool word anhedonia. Anhedonia. The it's the loss of of joy, loss of um, you, you, the things you used to enjoy, you don't enjoy anymore. That, that term, in, especially in depression literature, and stuff is called anhedonia. Actually, I'll write it up here so you can see the letter. Anhedonia. Right. So it's like the opposite. You've probably heard of like hedonism, which is the, like a philosophy of do whatever you find sort of pleasurable. Well, anhedonia then is sort of the opposite. It's like loss of pleasure, loss, you know, you don't enjoy things anymore. So if these three items are asking about those kind of things, that may be, you know, the, sort of the anhedonia factor. Maybe these are all about sort of um, changes in weight or weight loss or changes in activity or energy. And so these might be around sort of, you know, your sort of energy level or something like that. And that might be why, you know, these items go together. So you start to then identify what are the sub factors related to depression based on the content that they share and the fact that they're actually being put on this on the same or similar factors as one another and that's sort of how factor analysis allows us to sort of go through and look at the reliability and validity and things of items and subscales by helping us to identify which items go where how well they hang together, and we need to start judging them on, on the quality, the size of the loadings, how much this item actually really, really, you know, is explaining a, a decent amount of, of variance across the items, how much the items are actually, um, how much each item is really uh, sharing with other items is another measure. It's just, just like a, these commonalities are like um, a, a better um, approach um, to something like, um, to Chromebox, right? It's like it's getting the same uh, same idea as a Chromebox Alpha. Like, well, how good is this item at sharing variants with other items? It's just doing it in a, in a bit more sophisticated way than uh, than Chromebox Alpha does. Once we're able to, to find all those loadings and things, or f figure out how everything sort of works, and find a solution to the to the number of factors and extraction method uh, extraction method and all that stuff, um, we can then then use the information to compute factor scores. Um, the, it's the, the factor model is used to generate a combination of all the items to, to then create a sort of smart composite. So everybody gets a score this, that should be a better reflection of the true score for the latent variable than it is if you just were to add up all the items together because it actually is removing the unique variance out. So the unique variance, the specific and error variance is being removed from each item. So what you're combining together is just the part of the item that is related to the fact that you're trying to measure, right? So it's a, it's looking at only the common variance, and that's what's being added up to create the, the composite, which we call a factor score. Um, and then sometimes if you look at output from uh, a factor analysis, you get something called a factor coefficient matrix, which is the, these are just the coefficients that are used to create the factor scores. They're made from the loadings, but they're a little different. So it's just, these are, how you're actually able to combine items together to create the factor scores. And then this other, the other thing that we started talking about a second ago, I mentioned it and I sort of went away and uh, let's, let's go back to it a second. There's, um, the, so the two pieces often when it comes to the two steps are extraction and then rotation. The problem with the using eigenvalue, eigenvector deconstruction is that it's purely mathematical. It just, you just, sends things off into space and everything is kept orthogonal. So again, the first rejection goes out in space, the next one comes in and it has to be perpendicular. It's kept completely uncorrelated with one another. So they're, so they're, they're forced to be that way as the eigenvector 
uh, eigenvalue deconstruction sort of occurs, which means that some of the some of the factors that come in there may not be you know in the best position, the best placement in space to sort of account for variance because it's forced to be uh, orthogonal. So what rotation does is it, it is it sort of moves the the vectors in space ge geometrically to try to make the interpretation of the factors uh, and their items a little better. There's different kinds of rotation. We could spend a, you know a long time just talking about the different types of um, rotation, but the two big ones are: do we want to rotate orthogonally, which means that all the factors are kept. Uh, are kept orthogonal, they're kept independent, so they're not allowed to sort of relate to each other, or do we allow them to correlate, which is called an oblique rotation. So forget about the technical terms for a second, right? Orthogonal, oblique, whatever. Am I trying to show that I have multiple factors that are measuring different things, separate things, um, then I probably want to do an orthogonal rotation. I want to try to keep the factors separate, independent. If I'm trying to show that I have multiple sub-factors of the same thing, like uh, subscales of depression, well, because they're all measuring different components of depression, they're likely to be related. Like my, you know, if I'm high on anhedonia, I'm likely going to be high on sadness and those kinds of things of looking at the factors. So in that case, I'm, I'm probably going to want to allow the factors to relate to each other, to correlate. So that's called an oblique rotation, which means that the that as the, the, the vectors are being rotated in space, they're also being allowed to share the same space geometrically. They're, they're not being kept orthogonal. And what that does is sort of, you know, the, the oblique rotation oftentimes will help make the interpretation easier, but it's just a little more complicated mathematically because you're going to have to deal with more matrices, more things. Or an orthogonal matrix or an orthogonal rotation, you're going to get a factor matrix, the factor loading matrix, and then a rotated factor loading matrix that's supposed to help clean things up, make them a little more easy to interpret. With oblique, you're going to get, in addition to the, the factor loading matrix, you're going to get a structure matrix, a pattern matrix, and then also a factor correlation matrix. So there's more information. This tells you how much the, the factors actually correlate with one another. Um, the structure matrix tells you the overall correlation between items and factors. And then the pattern matrix tells you the unique relationship. So if I actually remove the overlap between factors and look at just the unique relationship that each item has with the factor, removing the other factors out of the equation, um, the pattern matrix oftentimes is the one you end up interpreting in an oblique rotation because it'll tell you the, a, a cleaner, nicer, neater pattern of how items and factors go together. So there's a lot of information. I'm not expecting you to know sort of everything. The takeaway here is orthogonal allows you to sort of keep factors separate. They're independent. They're doing different things. Or really, I, I, I'm not trying to test for different sub-factors of the same thing. I really have multiple items that are measuring different factors, different components, different things, different dimensions. They're from different domains. So I'm trying to keep them separate from one another. Oblique rotation allows you to look at... Uh, factors, sub-factors that are related to each other, and you actually want to allow them to relate because they're measuring similar things. They're all part of the same overall scale, so you actually want them to share space and that makes sense. Knowing that if you do an orthogonal rotation, it's going to be a little bit easier, but it's going to force factors to be separate, which may be sort of weird depending on, your, on the items you're using. Oblique rotation will likely give you a, an easier uh, interpretation of what of what items go with what. You have less of, of what are called complex loadings, where one item loads on multiple factors, which makes it kind of complicated to interpret. But you got a lot more things to interpret with one another. And sometimes when you let factors correlate, it can get kind of crazy. I was doing a factor analysis of a bunch of uh, items, like 20 items measuring critical race theory. Okay. And each factor has something like three, four, maybe five items on it. And uh, I was doing this, this factor analysis, and uh, what I noticed is when I uh, allowed the factors to correlate, which it, it really wouldn't work or fit unless I did, but once I allowed them to correlate, the correlations in this factor correlation matrix all went way, way up. So all the factors were correlated like at 0.8 or 0.9, which started to tell me, well, they're not very... Um, 
separate factors. So even though we're, we're getting different factors, they're so highly correlated that they're all sort of measuring very similar or very redundant things with one another because the correlation matrix, the correlation between all the factors is super, super high. So sometimes allowing them to correlate can lead you to the fact that you, you, I really don't have you know, five different sub-factors. I likely just have one general factor that's driving all the items, and that's why all the the, the, the sub-factors are so highly related to one another. All right. So one of the, one of the things that, that rotation does for us, so one of the things we're, we're, reason why we want to rotate is because one of the big goals, um, main goals often for factor analysis is try to achieve something called simple structure. It refers to the ease of interpretability of the factors. Right? I want to be able to interpret the factors and have an easy time trying to figure what items go with what and how to interpret them. So simple structure is achieved when an item only loads highly on a single factor. So there's like a one item to one factor sort of um, correspondence. It says, um, achieve when an item only loads highly on a single factor when multiple factors exist. So look at the previous slide here. Back here, back here, back here, back here. So here, this represents simple structure, right? Each item only corresponds to this one factor. But this also represents simple structure because this item only loads highly on factor one. This item only loads highly on factor two, right? So each item really only corresponds. It only tells me about one factor. So it's really easy to figure out what this, well, I mean, it's relatively easy to figure out what this factor is doing because I can look at the content of these items and it tells me. But if I have complex loadings, which is sort of the opposite of simple structure, it becomes a little bit more complicated. All right, so here is simple structure on this side. Here's a complex loading. So item three here is highly related to factor two and factor one. So if I'm trying to figure out what factor one and factor two are measuring, item number three here makes it complicated because if I'm trying to, to look at the items and what their content is and figure out what they're measuring, well, somehow they're both being indicated by this one item. Like the, the, you know, the, This is a measure of both of them. So somehow they, they are sharing whatever this is and that makes it more complicated, more difficult to interpret the factors because they, they are sharing the same items. So this is typically the goal. We want things to be simple, simple structure. Each item only loads on a single factor. Now, when I say loads, I mean loads highly. I'm not even gonna get into that, but, but it has a you know, substantial loading on only one factor. Because the way, the way exploratory factor analysis goes, every, all the items technically load on both factors. But it could be that the loadings you know, between say F1 and, um, and X4 it's there, but it's so it's close to zero. It's a negligible number, so we tend to leave it out of out of the diagrams because it's not a substantial loading. Well, we can't even have enough time to go into all this stuff. There's lots of things we could be talking about. I could probably spend I could probably spend most of the session <laughs> just talking about factor analysis. Um, so I'm trying not to do. Um, so just some differences here. Uh, I mentioned this before. The reason why you know, I talk about PCA, principal components analysis, being um, more descriptive. It actually drives me a little bit nuts when I see um, like publications out there trying to look at scales and they use principal components analysis, which in and of itself is not is fine, but then they'll replicate their findings or do, or somebody else will go through and test the same scale and they'll also use principal components analysis. There was one um, a, a paper that a colleague of mine, a grad student, sort of put out a couple of years ago, looking at a, I think it was a motion regulation scale, and it had been tested something like 10, 12 times in different countries, uh, like different translations and all kinds of stuff, and just uh, like 10 of the 12 of those all had used principal components analysis to test it. They never went forward and actually used factor analysis or confirmatory factor analysis or something else to test it. I thought it was just nuts. They just kept using the same descriptive method. So. All right, so some differences. Factor analysis produces factors, and principal components analysis produces components. Well, it seems sort of lame, but that's what it is. We call what comes out of factor analysis, there are factors, and what comes out of principal components analysis are components. We theorize, we hypothesize that factors are causing the variables. So my depression 
My level of depression is what is driving my response to the items, okay? Components are just aggregates. So components are saying, look, here's a bunch of items that seem to be together. Let's combine them together into a composite. So it's much more, it's, it's less theoretically driven. I'm just saying, look, I think these items go together. Let's combine them, right? So they're, they're creating sort of smarter uh, composites than just adding them all up but they're still just sort of putting composites in there and not really trying to identify um, underlying theory, okay? Uh, conceptually, you can think about, you know, uh, the factors are driving the items, or here, we're just trying to identify that these items sort of relate, so let's combine them together into a component. Right. Um, fact, this is a big difference without going into a whole deep dive on stuff. Factor analysis analyzes only the variance that's shared. It tries to identify the common variance and it only analyzes that variance when trying to put together the factors. With principal components analysis, it's a little different. It starts off assuming that all of the variance is common. So it's a weird assumption. So this tries to identify what h squared is. Let's, say, let's, let's try to identify h squared. And the way that h squared gets identified in the first run is what makes the difference between, say, things like, there's different versions of this, like with the uh, like principal axis factoring, right? It's different than, say, um, what's the I'm thinking of? Uh, there's a bunch of them. It's different than, say, maximum likelihood factor analysis or these different approaches. A lot of them differ in how they initially, the, the initial estimate, initial estimate of h squared is where a lot of them differ. But it's still, they try to identify what the commonality is in the items before sort of starting the approach, starting the factor analysis. Principal components analysis assumes that the h squared for all items is 100%. Starts off thinking that 100% of all the variance of all the items in the scale is common. And it starts with that sort of assumption, which is a weird one. But it does that. It says, I think that these items are sharing 100% of the variance, and then does the fact analysis sort of, sort of goes through the process, which is why um, there's a tendency for everything to be overestimated. Um, the loadings are too big, the number of factors estimated, the number of factors that um, you extract, everything sort of tends to be overestimated with PCA because it starts with this very strange sort of idea. These all start with some initial estimate of the, of the commonality and um, to try to get close. So it tends to be closer. So when you simulate, and you, like, you generate data in a simulation, these factor analysis approaches tend to get a lot closer because they start off closer. They start off with an initial estimate that's closer to the commonality. This one starts off with an, uh, an estimate that's huge, way, way, way too big. So, uh, so what you end up getting is an overestimated uh, commonality in the end anyway. So factor analysis asks the question, what are the underlying processes that could produce these correlations? What, what, you know, what, what, what things seems to be underlying or driving these items? Well, PCA, really the point is just try to try to summarize empirical associations. It's much more data driven. And again, this is also a, a one time through approach. Factor analysis sort of iterates through and tries to find a converged set of, of values, tries to find loadings, um, that, that leads to a, a stable, converged, sort of um, uh, reproduced correlation matrix, and, and only then does it actually then converge and give you a final model. This one just does it one time through and doesn't bother, bother to check. The way this works and how this works is that when you actually go to do the, the factor analysis, in, in PCA, in fact, the, the correlation matrix actually looks like a regular correlation matrix that has ones down the diagonal. You know, if you go back to that um, math anxiety scale, like the diagonal of it was all ones. So it puts ones in there, and what it does is it actually indicates to the, to the eigenvalue, eigenvector deconstruction, that it's going to use 100% of each of the items to sort of start. 
with factor analysis, um, it puts in the diagonals, it puts some estimate of the commonality in instead of one. So it indicates to the, the eigenvalue deconstruction that only some portion of each item's variance is common, and that's how it sort of starts off and sort of iterates through. So PCA begins with ones, so like it extracts all variants, it sort of uses every part of the variable, uh, assuming that it's all common to begin with, and sort of gives everything equal weight. Commonalities are estimated as output of the model. We, we, it only comes as an output that you don't estimate to sort of put into the process, and it will often lead to um, an over-extraction of factors, an overestimate of commonalities, and that's sort of the issue. As I mentioned before, um, factor analysis tries to begin. Uh, try, it begins to try to only use the common variance by using some kind of estimation method. Again, I was talking about there being dozens of different factor analysis uh, approaches. Most of them differ, at least in, in in this one way. There's other ways too, but in this one way, in in how they try to uh, initially estimate the the um, the commonality with. Um, like for instance, I mentioned principal axis factoring. It's in the diagonals, it puts the, like I mentioned R squared, it puts the R squared of that item, say item one, predict, you know, correlated with all the other items, item two, item three to item K. It puts in the, the squared multiple correlation, oftentimes referred to as the SMC, the squared multiple correlation for each item. It puts that in the diagonal as its estimate and begins there. Uh, and so it, it, it uses this as a, as a proxy for um, the commonality to start with and then sort of iterates through to find a, a better solution. Um, and placing, so it places them in the diagonal of the correlation matrix to start with and then sort of starts the factor analysis process. It analyzes only the common variance, outputs are much more realistic, often much smaller than principal components analysis and uh, it usually results in fewer factors and just a, a, a simpler, smaller solution than principal component analysis does. Which is why I mentioned that principal components is often used at the beginning. Sometimes in the very beginning, it's useful to over-extract factors to, to, to see how many you actually can make work or how many are functional. It's useful sometimes to overestimate things so that you um, you don't leave things out. You don't miss factors that maybe are there. So uh, sometimes at the very beginning, principal components analysis makes sense. Let's sort of let's, let's extract just you know slightly too many factors and test them out. Let's um, all those things sort of make sense when you're exploring and trying to figure out what's going on in the data. But as you know more about it, as you as you start to sort of get used to the items and the matrices you're working with, um, principal components doesn't make as much sense anymore. Um, anyway, so what else? How many factors do you sh should you extract? Um, this is oftentimes uh, this can this can oftentimes be uh, you know debatable in terms of you know what your motivation is. So the first question is, all right, well, how many do you expect? So if you created a scale, you probably created them with with a certain number of subscales um, in mind. So you probably have some kind of expectation for how many subfactors there should be. So start there. Um, like I said before, one convention is to extract all factors that have an eigenvalue greater than one. Uh, something called the Kaiser criteria. It's the default and like SPSS and some other programs that when you do a factor analysis, it automatically assumes you want all the factors with eigenvalues greater than one. Uh, another is to extract all factors with non-negative eigenvalues. That one's a little bit funky because a lot of times you won't even get negatives, but uh, you end up extracting way too many then. But um, there's another one that says, look at this thing called the scree plot. Um, the reality is you're likely going to try multiple different ways, multiple different extractions, multiple different numbers of factors to try to find one that makes sense, that is a usable interpretation of the items uh, into factors. Um, it's very rare that you're going to do a factor analysis or principal components analysis once and have the final answer you want. Usually you're going to run it and say, okay, what if I had you know one more factor? Or what if I had one fewer factor? What if I tried using um, principal axis factoring versus principal components? And you try to look at um, the different 
outcomes, the different outputs to see uh, which one seems to make the most sense given the items, given the content, given the, the factors, and given you know, what it is you're trying to, to do with the items, you're likely to do it multiple times. So try multiple numbers and see what gives the best interpretation. Sometimes it, it's going to be, it's a, there's, there's a bit of art to the factor analysis, a bit of subjectivity to it because um, you're going to end up sort of playing around with it and sort of figuring out which one seems to work the best or which one which one is the one you can sell the easiest, which one is the one that, you know, you can convince people that, that exists um, if you're going to write this up in a paper or something. So just to, I mentioned the screen plot. So oftentimes when when you're looking at the, the sort of eigenvalue greater than one, when you do a factor analysis, say in SPSS, you're going to get a, a, a table like this one. It's not a table that I mentioned in the in the list because it, it, it isn't directly related to... Um, you know, the, the factor loading matrix, even though it sort of is. But um, these are the sort of initial eigenvalues. And this is, so this, I have 12 items. And if I, if I extract all 12 factors, pretty much one, you know, one per item, you can see that the first factor explains the most amount of, of variance. The eigenvalue total here is 3.513. And the next one is 3.141. Okay, so these seem to be about you know, it's about equal. This one then goes down and then it starts to drop and then it starts to slowly just sort of cycle down through to very small numbers. And you can see the, you know, it tells you the percentage of variance it explains. So the first two seem to be explaining quite a bit. This, the third one, yeah, not so much. But we can start to look at, all right, so what if I decide to keep, so here I would have kept the eigenvalue deconstruction, I'm sorry, the Kaiser criteria I mentioned before. It would have only extracted three, right? It would have said, all right, here's, there's only three factors that have eigenvalues over one. So it would have decided on three factors and the rest of it would have been done assuming only three factors. It actually kept four because I actually had to choose four. And I want to show you that the, 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 the when you actually go to extract, I mean, when you keep all four factors, you can then um, sum up all the loadings across the items for a factor. You can actually then get the, the sort of sum of squared loadings, which is you know, going to be reproducing each of these sort of eigenvalues. But now it's a bit smaller because we're not extracting all the factors. We only extracted four. So this has gone down a little bit, and then I can actually rotate things around. This is a, it's a sort of extraction method, but I'm assuming this is probably a, uh, an orthogonal rotation. It took some vari some variance from the second item and moved it to the third. So it looks like we have, t you know, these are remaining above one. But this fourth one never really gets any better. It gets closer to one, but it never really goes above one as a, as a rule. So it's likely if I went back, I probably, even though I tried it, I probably would go back, dump that item, or dump that factor, and maybe go back to looking at just using three factors, which is what the casual criteria would have told me to do anyway. So again, so the, there, there are 12 orthogonal projections in the space to try to, to explain all of these 12 items and their correlations. But I'm trying to explain all 12 of those with just three of them and to see how good a job I am doing and sort of reduce things down. To, do three factors actually explain the, um, the correlation between items well, if it does, then it tells me that I, there's probably some theoretical um, support there for this factors and the sub-factors that are finding in my scale. All right, and the last, just a picture of the scree plot. There's another way in which people claim to choose the number of factors. And it's just the idea that if you were to take um, and draw a line straight, you know, from here that goes through the points. At some point, you know, the it, the, um, the values are going to deviate from this line, and anything then above the line, you would extract. So this one's obvious, right? So yeah, this one, that one, this one. So in this case, both the scree plot, the scree plot. Um, and uh, so a Kaiser criteria sort of agree. Right. There's only three potential factors because there's there's only three that are above this sort of line here. It's also because we look at where one is, 
All right, here's one. Oh, well, there's only three factors that are above one as well. Sometimes these won't agree. Sometimes the scree plot might tell you that there's more than the Kaiser criteria will tell you. Sometimes it'll be more, you know, more or less. So these are different ways of making suggestions of the number of factors that you should extract in the data, depending on this. And there's a reason for this, this idea that once you get down to this point, this line represents just a, a random cycling down of residual variance, right? These are leftovers that it's just sort of cycling down slowly, explain, trying to explain the remainder of the residual variance. Anything that, that's above this sort of cycle is really a, um, you know, a, a real factor that's trying to explain variance and not just a random cycling down. So this, this is what's called scree. Scree, is, it's a weird term because it comes from like cliffs, right? That you have, you have a cliff. At the bottom of the cliff, there's like pebbles and stuff. Right, from stuff that's fallen off of this. So there's a cliff, and then at some point it starts to sort of do this where the scree is. So the, the scree is the junk at the bottom of a cliff. So we think about this thing as here's my, you know, what, what is the cliff face? And then what is the scree, the pebbles of junk that are at the bottom? So that's what's called the scree plot. It's sort of a weird term, but I guess it makes some sense. So it's another way of sort of deciding this whole process, the whole point of talking about all this stuff is that if, oh, sorry, one, one last slide, that was the last one. Um, how do you know when a factor structure is good? Wow, well, that's a whole other story too. Um, it's good when you can explain it, when, you, when the items make sense, you know, you're able to interpret them and they seem to go together in some way that is, is, is explainable, it's theoretical. And uh, so if you have useful, um, explainable factors, then that's probably a good factor structure. When it makes sense and it has really simple structure, and when, is, when it is the most useful, meaning if you have factors that you can use as predictors of other things or you can use as outcomes, that's probably a pretty good factor structure. How do you interpret factors? Well. That's a good question. This is where practice and just some, you know, some of the art comes in because you got to look at the content of the items and start to figure out, well, okay, well, what makes these items on the same factor? So share, uh, you know, what would cause them to be driven by the same thing? And figuring that out is how you then figure out what the factor is doing. You know, whatever would drive the items to, to or drive people to respond to items in the same way, then is the factor underlying those items that are sort of sharing space in the same factor. But it's hard because sometimes the items you think will go together don't. And the items that uh, you would think will never go together end up being on the same factor and it becomes sometimes very difficult to interpret. So that's why it takes some practice and it takes some, oftentimes, a lot of playing around with the factor uh, and the factor analysis and the factor structure to make things sort of interpretable and sort of useful and make sense. Right, I think that's the last one. Okay, so the whole point of this, fact, it's, it, factor analysis is one of the primary things that get used to try to show that items uh, are really going together. That if, if I'm developing a, a depression inventory and I want, to, I want to convince you that it's measuring depression, I gotta go beyond uh, chrome box alpha and show that there's one pattern of, of covariances. I actually need to show you that, that uh, the, these items all share space, that there's commonality, that there's decent loadings for all the items on the factors, that, there, that it seems to hold up under this much more complex sort of theoretical model that can be tested by the, the factor analytic sort of approach. And if I can do that, then it's much easier to convince people that the items are reliable, they're, that they're reliably sort of measuring the same construct. And I can use that sort of smart composite that comes out of the factor scores to then, to then do a better job of testing for validity and relating it to other things, like you compare it to a criterion like a 
clinical interview or to compare it to other factors, other, uh, other measures and show that, that I'm getting a correlation. And it's better because if I do it with factor scores on both sides, I have my criteria or my, my other, my, my other um, measure, my other scale I'm trying to measure. If they're both analyzed with factor analysis, I'm able to get rid of the noise, the unique, you know, the specific and error variance out of each item. So when I add them together, all that, all that error has not been compounded together. I like to get a cleaner measure of the correlations between them because they're likely to be a lot more reliable because I got rid of all the noise. So I can actually test for reliability in a lot better, smarter way. I can create composites that are better, smarter, more useful. And uh, at the same time, I can actually show that the atoms go together and have a test of the reliability, the internal consistency that all is being done all at the same time, all combined, all together.